Imagine being able to successfully sell something that doesn't exist, something so outrageous, ambitious, and brazen that its very conception seems implausible. Yet for one cunning man from Nigeria, this audacious fantasy became reality. In 1995, Emmanuel Nude managed to convince a major Brazilian bank to hand over $242 million for an international airport development project, a project that existed solely in New Day's imagination. Through masterful deception and psychological play, he was able to sell nothing more than plans and promises to ambitious investors hungry for wealth. But who was Emmanuel New Day, and how did he orchestrate what would become one of the most incredible cons in financial history? With no internet or modern fact-checking abilities to disprove his lies, New Day exploited every advantage. This is the story of the extraordinary scam that saw one man sell fresh air for a quarter of a billion dollars. Our story takes place in the bustling heart of Nigeria, a country full of vitality and dreams. As one of Africa's most populous nations, Nigeria was undergoing significant changes. It had recently declared Abuja as its new capital, marking the birth of a city with a growing population and endless possibilities. In this energetic atmosphere, a remarkable tale of audacity, deceit, and unbridled ambition would take center stage. At the heart of this story stands a man named Emmanuel Nude. As a child growing up in the bustling city of Lagos, Emmanuel Nude exhibited a voracious intellect that marked him out from an early age. Despite Nigeria's instability in the post-colonial period, he remained fiercely determined to escape poverty. Emmanuel channeled his formidable mental skills and ambition into academics. Through tireless studying, he gained entry into the University of Nigeria, where he discovered a natural affinity for complex finance courses. Upon graduating in the mid-1970s, the economic turmoil gripping the nation presented few opportunities for a young graduate. But Emmanuel was not discouraged. He landed a low-level role at Lagos-based Union Bank and quickly shone as a dynamic staffer. Relentless self-improvement and deft networking saw Emmanuel rise within the ranks at a meteoric pace. By the late 1980s, he had achieved the prestigious position of director, one of the most senior roles within the large commercial bank's hierarchy. As Nigeria entered a new phase of development and modernization under military president Ibrahim Babangida, grand infrastructure projects were unveiled to develop the new capital city Abuja and stimulate the economy. Emmanuel took a keen interest in ambitious plans for a new international airport that would put Abuja on the global map. It was this large-scale aviation scheme that planted the seed of an audacious idea in Emmanuel's mind. However, to execute his developing plan, he needed strategic assistance. He leveraged his connections and influence in Nigeria's banking circles to assemble a secret group of finance experts. They began preparing for an audacious deception that would exploit the global banking industry. Under Emmanuel's cunning leadership, the team was ready to orchestrate the most ambitious scheme of the century. Emmanuel assembled a team of five banking specialists and began the first phase of the deception, which involved gaining the trust of unsuspecting targets. To establish credibility, the group created fake identities with great care. Emmanuel assumed the role of the central bank governor, while others took on personas such as deputy governor and aviation director. They then used their connections in Nigeria's financial circles to obtain letterheads and fax machines to send seemingly legitimate correspondences. In January 1995, a series of misleading faxes were sent out to select banks worldwide. The message was worded precisely, proposing Nigeria's intention to build a new international airport for Abuja, which would be funded by private investment. The fax requested expressions of interest for the estimated $242 million project. Their target audience was banks with substantial capital and a willingness to take risks on infrastructure projects in developing nations. One of the recipients was Banco Noroeste, a mid-sized commercial institution in Brazil. Banco Noroeste was looking for ventures in faster-growing regions, such as West Africa, as the Brazilian economy was slowing down in the 1990s. Nelson Sakaguchi, the branch director, was sitting in his office in Sao Paulo when he received an intriguing fax that looked official. The fax requested interest in a certain $242 million project somewhere in West Africa. Sakaguchi saw potential in this and responded with a request for more details. 
This was precisely what Emmanuel had been hoping for. The bait had been set, and it was time to reel in the prey through cunning persuasion and deception. With Sakaguchi on the hook, Emmanuel's scheme had played out perfectly. Emmanuel decided to impersonate the then central bank governor, Paul Aguma. He called the Brazilian and enthusiastically endorsed the airport opportunity during their initial discussion. During the call, Emmanuel spun an elaborate tale describing Nigeria's ambition to rapidly modernize Abuja since designating it as the new capital in 1991. He provided specific details about a large international airport that would serve millions annually and have ample space for planes and cargo. Sakaguchi was interested but cautious about long-distance deals. To ease his concerns, Emmanuel proposed a private meeting in London to finalize the agreement face-to-face. -face. He downplayed concerns about construction beginning in four years, suggesting that they should focus on planning first. Emmanuel and his team prepared forged documents before traveling to England, including fake airport designs, made-up traffic reports, and phony papers from the Ministry of Aviation. Upon arriving at the hotel in London, they disguised themselves as important Nigerian officials and treated Sakaguchi lavishly. They even gave presentations with forged photos alongside politicians. Emmanuel showed Sakaguchi projections, exaggerating the airport's profit potential. He implied other banks were also interested but offered Noroest preferential terms, including a 10% stake. When Sakaguchi voiced reluctance over unapproved spending, Emmanuel increased the pressure. Claiming an imminent three-week planning window, he threatened to move on to other clients that would be interested in the deal. And just to sweeten the deal, Emmanuel offered a $10 million personal commission. With his job and vast returns on the line, Sakaguchi caved, mistakenly believing the ruse, and shaking on $242 million with a $3 million deposit. Emmanuel had reeled in his mark for the ultimate con. With the initial $3 million deposit secured from Banco Noroest, Emmanuel knew he needed to rapidly access and launder the full $242 million to avoid detection. However, moving such enormous sums directly would trigger major anti-money laundering alerts. So Emmanuel employed an elaborate layering process across multiple international jurisdictions. First, he had subsequent installments from Banco Noroest paid into several Nigerian banks he controlled. These amounts were kept just under $10,000 to avoid automatic reporting requirements. Over the next three years, Sakaguchi periodically funneled installments, averaging $6 million each into 17 separate Nigerian banks, just below the threshold, triggering his management's attention. From there, Emmanuel's insiders disseminated the cash in smaller amounts through a deliberately complex web of offshore shell companies and foreign institutions. None were the wiser as money ping-ponged between Switzerland, Britain, and Hong Kong. The clever scheme mixed illicit funds while avoiding detection. However, Emmanuel had no intention of squandering the profits. He strategically reinvested the funds in legitimate properties across Nigeria, including prime real estate in Lagos, accruing rental income streams. He further invested in blue-chip stock markets worldwide, establishing a lawful empire that disguised criminal origins. To keep up the ruse that the non-existent airport project was moving ahead on schedule, Emmanuel had to periodically update Sakaguchi with falsified progress reports. Without the Brazilian's knowledge, no construction work was taking place. The complex deception continued as Sakaguchi kept transferring millions of dollars, oblivious to the fact that his bank had been infiltrated and funds were being stolen internationally through the most advanced money laundering scheme ever seen in the financial world. In 1998, the large Santiago-based bank Banco Santander began negotiations to acquire and merge with Banco Noroest. As part of standard due diligence procedures, Santander's accountants performed an audit of Noroest's financial statements and capital assets. During the investigation, the board of directors of Noroest Bank found major discrepancies in the bank's shareholder equity and investment portfolio, which were unaccounted for and amounted to approximately one-third of the bank's total assets. The board members were alarmed and called for an emergency meeting to discuss the issue. At the meeting, the board members grew suspicious of fraud and summoned Nelson Sakaguchi, the bank's branch director, for urgent questioning. Under intense pressure, Sakaguchi finally cracked and revealed Nigeria's supposed multi-million dollar airport project that had vanished substantial funds over three years. Noroest's board was outraged upon learning of the elaborate ruse. They launched a full internal forensic audit to investigate the missing money. 
forensic accountants meticulously analyzed years of transactions and paper trails, discovering the complex international movement of laundered funds across multiple jurisdictions. They informed Brazilian authorities and Interpol, leading to a large-scale international criminal investigation. Investigators used clues from banking records and wire transfers to piece together the shadowy money trail. It ultimately led back to Nigeria, but officials there were hesitant to cooperate without robust anti-money laundering laws. Pressure mounted from Western financial regulatory agencies as Swiss prosecutors took drastic action, freezing all identified Nigerian bank accounts tied to the crime. Nigerian regulators were compelled to provide crucial suspect information, including the identification of account owners after being coerced. This unmasked Emmanuel New Day and his inner circle as the culprits. Noroest incurred massive losses, imperiling the bank's acquisition deal. Determined directors sought to recoup stolen fortunes globally and prosecute the criminals behind this audacious international fraud. With Emmanuel uncovered as the mastermind, Nigeria faced international pressure to prosecute him domestically for the $242 million fraud. However, they lacked strict laws at the time to try such sophisticated financial crimes. While Nigerian officials dragged their feet, Banco Noroest's lawyers took aggressive legal action, filing civil suits against Emmanuel and his accomplices in foreign courts. This lit a fire under Nigerian authorities. In 2004, in response to growing crimes, Nigeria established the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission as the primary law enforcement agency for banking corruption and money laundering cases. Armed with new coercive powers, EFCC investigators were finally able to apprehend five of Emmanuel's co-conspirators. Rumors swirled that the sixth member may have met an untimely death arranged by Emmanuel to ensure his silence. However, prosecuting Emmanuel in Nigeria proved difficult as well. During Abuja court proceedings, he brazenly attempted to bribe judges and several officials with gift-wrapping luxury homes and vehicles. The case was threatened by corruption leading to the hearings being quickly moved to Lagos. However, Emmanuel had infiltrated high places and was even accused of attempting to bribe the EFCC chairman with $75,000. Prosecutors, frustrated with the obstacles, offered plea deals to Emmanuel if he reimbursed the victims. But when he refused a $10 million proposal, they demanded significantly more. A damning eyewitness account from Nelson Sakaguchi finally forced Emmanuel to agree to pay $120 million, as well as a $10 million fine and a 25-year sentence. However, Nigeria's unstable justice system is often influenced by well-funded corruption. Within a few months, Emmanuel's connections had secured his early release after serving less than two years in prison. Despite only serving a fraction of his sentence, Emmanuel Nude's outrageous $242 million fraud left a lasting impact. The audacious scam exposed vulnerabilities in the global financial system, prompting reforms. That's it for today's video. Thank you for your time. We'd love to know your thoughts on this issue in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Your support helps us reach more people with our content. Thank you for watching and consider watching our other videos right here.